It's a great pleasure to have Robert Dougherty, please talk about Hardinian arrays. If you know, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask the question, then go back and mute yourself. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Z. It's always a pleasure to be here speaking to the experimental seminar. Uh, a pleasure to be here speaking on home turf, so to speak. Uh, just last week, I was at a conference at the University of South Alabama. I had a, a lovely time there, heard a lot of great talks, met a lot of interesting people, a lot of nice people, have some great ideas to coming back now to work on some research. But there's always a little bit of culture shock, I think, when I step outside of the experimental seminar, because I go and I listen to 10 or 12 talks or more, and mm -hmm. I think only one of them had an integer sequence in it. And that's really a shame. I don't know where you get off holding a conference with only one integer <laughs> you know, on average every 12 talks. So I thought that I wanted to start off with one here that's just completely unrelated to the talk, but kind of in the spirit of the, the bigger picture of the talk. So this is a, a nice story that happened on the OAAS about four or five years ago when I was just coming here to Rutgers. Uh, about four years ago, an art professor submitted this sequence to the OAAS. Now, normally, when you hear things like, oh, there's a new sequence by that art professor, you start to get a little suspicious because normally those kinds of sequences don't tend to be the most interesting ones. But this one pleasantly has a, a nice end to the story. So the sequence, if you examine it, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then it drops down to one, and then two, four, skips three, five, six, eight, skips seven, then it skips 10, it goes on like this. And I don't see any obvious pattern here for, for what's happening, how to generate the next term. I don't see a rule. I don't see a formula. And that's because there really isn't an obvious pattern or rule, but there is a simple one. And that simple one is this. So you start off with the value one. And then if you want to compute the nth term, what you do is you ask whether n is prime or composite. If n is prime, you take the first prime after the previous term and you write it backwards. If n is composite, you take the first composite after the previous term and write it backwards, which is not the most natural of definitions of sequences, I'll, I'll grant you. But to, to give you an example, by accident, it turns out that a of 9 happens to be 9 right here, this 9. And so if you want to compute the 10th term, you say, well, 10 is composite. So what's the first composite after 9? Well, that's 10. And if you write that backwards, that's 1. So that's why a of 10 is 1. Okay, not the, not the most natural thing to think of. Uh, <laughs> but when you submit things like this, there's a whole uh, cadre of editors whose job it is to look at these kinds of things and see if they're worth considering. And uh, this one inspired a little bit of conversation immediately because the rule was quick enough or simple enough that you can write it up in Maple or Mathematica or your favorite programming language. And some editors computed a couple hundred thousand terms because it was easy enough to do. And surprisingly, they couldn't find any term of the sequence that had more than three digits. A million terms in, 10 million terms in, 100 million terms in, nothing was over 1,000. In fact, nothing was over 909 of all things. Why 909? I don't know. That just happened to be the case. And so this started a big flurry. Uh, lots of people were talking about it. There was some discussion in the comments. I think there was an email on the mailing list. Even Neil told us about it the next day, uh, just before the experimental seminar. And within a day of this being submitted, we had a proof that the sequence is, in fact, bounded. And even better, the maximum value is this strange 909. Now, the moral of the story is not at all about this sequence in particular. The moral of the story is that when you submit things to the OAIS, you get your data in front of a lot of people. And you get it in front of enough people that if there's an interesting conjecture to be found there, there's a decent chance that someone will find it. And when someone finds it, there's a decent chance that someone somewhere will at least have an idea of how to start proving it, like in this case. Now, the greatest example that I've seen of this in the past year was a project by uh, these mathematicians, Emmanuel Cowers and Christoph Kuchan, who are in Linz in Austria. They had, uh, they probably know better than most people in the world uh, how useful the OAAS is and some important facts about it. So like the, this above, there's a lot of data in the OAAS. There's 350,000 sequences, maybe 360,000 sequences, maybe more. I, I forget the exact count right now. Uh, an enormous amount of things that you could look at. 
just terms, conjectures people have put in there, comments, really this wealth of information. So that's thing one. Thing two is there's way more than any person could reasonably understand in, in one go. Even the team of editors, there's no way that the team understands all of the possible connections you could be making with different sequences. There's just too much to, to, to sift through. Except Neil Sloan. Even Neil, I would uh, I would put it to him that he there's he must not understand the vast majority of things. Okay, understand, sure, but be able to comprehend at one time everything. It's 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 impossible for a human to do. Well, but uh, Cowers and Kuchan had the great idea that you could maybe have a computer try and make the connections for you. You could write some programs that would automatically go through the OEIS and try and mine it for interesting conjectures that maybe no one has noticed before. Kind of like this strange sequence in the beginning. All you had to do was compute enough terms and compute the maximum of what you've seen so far, and you had a conjecture. So uh, Manuel and Kristoff were specifically interested in, in one kind of conjecture, which they were interested in knowing whether there were sequences in the OEIS that might satisfy recurrences that no one had noticed yet. And by recurrences, I mean something kind of specific. I mean a linear recurrence with polynomial coefficients. So I want to know if, given a sequence, is there some linear combination of a fixed number of terms where the coefficients are allowed to be polynomials that equals zero? Uh, and when a sequence satisfies some recurrence relation like this, we call it definite, a technical term. But uh, it means that it satisfies this kind of recurrence, polynomial coefficients. So Manuel and Christoph wanted to know, are there sequences in the OEIS which might be definite that no one has yet observed being definite? Uh, let alone prove, are there sequences no one's even thought could be definite up to this point? Now, it's a pretty classical problem in the experimental setting to, given a bunch of data, try and guess whether the sequence that it comes from might satisfy uh, some definite recurrence. And how it works in the classical setting is you use undetermined coefficients. Hey, uh, did you define definite for the non-experts? Uh, yes, just right here. Just uh, This is definite. This is all. Okay. Yeah, no, nothing more technical than linear recurrence with polynomial coefficients. Uh, there may be other definitions, but we'll work with this one for now. Anyway, I, I call it pyrrhicative. Definite is a generating function of a pyrrhicative sequence, but some people call it definite, but I don't like that. Okay, bye. Yeah, yeah. Some people call it definite, some people call it p-recursive, some people might even call this holonomic, depending on who you're talking to, but uh, lots of different words. But if you just keep in mind linear recurrence, polynomial coefficients, that's all we want for now. Okay, so uh, the classical way to guess whether a recurrence, uh, sorry, a sequence satisfies one of these recurrences is to use undetermined coefficients. So you take a sequence, A, and you say, I'm going to make a guess that the sequence satisfies a second order recurrence. And I'm going to make another guess that the polynomials that I use as coefficients are linear. So I have two terms, I multiply them both by linear polynomials, and I should get zero. Now, what you do with this setup is you just plug in values of n. n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Just go as many times as you have data points of your sequence. And every value that you plug in for n, you will get a linear equation in the unknown coefficients of your polynomials. So you get a big system of linear equations that you want to solve for the coefficients. And if you're lucky, this system has some non-trivial solution. It always has a zero solution, of course, so you hope there's some non-zero solution. And this will give you a guess, some plausible guess, a recurrence that your data seems to satisfy up to a certain point. And then you can go back and go, OK, I'm pretty sure that this is the recurrence. How can I try and prove that now after the fact? Uh, and if you're lucky, there are certain cases where just making this guess counts as a proof. But uh, in the general case, maybe you have to go back and actually think a little bit about how to do this proof. Uh, now, Manuel and Christoph were interested in trying to improve this classical guessing procedure because one drawback to this. Yeah, Robert, let me interrupt uh, because it's relevant. There are some cautionary tales about sequences that seem to be uh, pericastic for many, many, many terms but eventually fail. And I have a joint paper with Neil Sloan about it. Uh, so that's... About the Pissot sequences, I think. Right, exactly. And you know about them too, right? Yeah, yeah. A, a very neat paper, in fact. 
So in the general case, you do have to be careful. Just guessing the recurrence is not enough. In specific cases, you get lucky, but you should always think about it after you make your guess. Now, in this classical approach has one drawback, which is that you really need to have enough data. So if you just made your order big enough, or if you made the polynomials a high enough degree, you would just have more variables in this equation than you had equations. So you would be guaranteed to have some non-trivial solution. But there's a decent chance that if you make this the case artificially, you're going to find complete nonsense guesses. You know, you, your program will spit out a guess that is obviously wrong. You've kind of overfit the data by adding too much complexity. So if you want to do this, you need to have sufficient amount of data to actually match the complexity of the recurrence that you're talking about so that you have more equations than unknowns, or at the very least, the same number of equations as unknowns. So Christoph uh, and Manuel were interested in trying to improve this, where what if you don't have enough data? What if you have fewer equations than variables? Can you try and find some reasonable way to still guess a recurrence? Because there are sequences where it's just prohibitively expensive to compute another term. Uh, for example, things where you're trying to enumerate kinds of permutations. This is very expensive. So they came up with an idea. They came up with a neat technique that I won't get into the details about, but they did some lattice reduction ideas where you look at certain solutions and you reduce them in certain ways. And, and from this, you can make some heuristic arguments that what comes out should be a pretty good guess, even if you don't have enough data. And when they finished writing up this technique, there are, <laughs> the whole point of their project is, what better place to try it out than the entirety of the OEIS? So what they did is they downloaded the whole database and they fed every single sequence one by one into their fancy lattice reduction guessing procedure. And they wanted to see what it would spit out uh, because maybe they will happen upon something that their new technique, even in sequences where there's not much data, can find a recurrence that no one had even noticed before, let alone prove. Now, the results of their project were as follows. The first thing they produced was a lot of junk. So you feed 350,000 sequences into some guess, some guesser, you're going to get some junk. It's, it's going to happen. They got a lot of recurrences that were clearly wrong. Just no fault of theirs. It just, it will happen when you're trying to make guesses. You have to be able to recognize that a lot of your guesses will be nonsense and they need to discard those. The next kind of thing it produced were some recurrences that were very easy or were already known. So the kind of recurrence that you might look at it and go, OK, sure, this sequence satisfies that recurrence. But you know, why do we care about this recurrence? Or we've known this for years, and it's not a big deal. And so you have to discard those as well as not being particularly interesting. But the third kind of thing that they found were interesting recurrences. So out of all 350 some thousand sequences, they boiled it down to 20 interesting hits. So they found about 20 sequences that seemed to satisfy these linear recurrences that no one had proven before. And they didn't seem to be obviously wrong or obviously right in either case. It seemed like they agreed with the data and there was really a need for some proof there. Uh, in many cases, no one had even <laughs> seen this recurrence before. Uh, and the sequences were not all of a particular kind. It wasn't like, oh, they're all, uh, they're all counting permutations. They're all enumerating certain graphs. They were from a variety of times, a variety of subjects. Uh, what brought them together is just that they seem to be defining. So here's one example of the kind of thing that they found. So uh, consider this sequence. A of n is the number of permutations of n copies of the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, such that any two neighboring entries differ by, at most, 1. Yeah. So easy example here, if n is two, you get two copies of the set and you've got this permutation right here is, is one of the valid permutations. So two is followed by one, that's fine because two and one differ by one. One is followed by one, which is okay because we have two different ones and they differ by zero. And then one is followed by two and three and three and four and, and so on. So you wanna count the number of permutations of two copies or n copies in general and figure out what that is. So uh, the recurrence guesser uh, guessed that this sequence was definite and that it satisfied a certain recurrence. And Manuel and Christoph were able to prove that, in fact, it is. Robert, so is a fix 
So it's only interesting when you have only one, two, three, four, five, and you look at n copies of one, n copies of two, and you look at so-called multi-set permutations or words in the alphabet one, two, three, four, five. We have exactly n ones and so on, uh, avoiding uh, avoiding one, two, two, one, one, three. This right. Is, this uh, might be maybe this is already well known. Uh, actually, so this may be a doable by the so-called good injection thing. We have to talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, th that might be even well known. We could look it up in the UAS, though. I forget, but that was not an example that they found. Maybe they discarded something that we already knew. Ah, okay. okay, so they guessed a definite recurrence, and they proved that it was definite. However, the recurrence is too big to put on one slide. And this is one reason why no one ever gets this recurrence. So uh, Manuel and Christoph were able to prove that this sequence satisfied this recurrence right here. So this is a fourth order recurrence. Way over here on the right-hand side, you'll see that there are one, two, three, four different terms of the sequence. And every term is being multiplied by a degree 16 polynomial, I believe. Uh, and in fact, I lied. It, the recurrence was too big for the previous slide. It's also too big for this slide. I had to leave out most of the recurrence because you know degree 16 polynomials with these huge coefficients turn out to be a little unwieldy. OK, so how do you prove this kind of thing? You find this recurrence, you make a guess. What do you do? Well, I'll so tell you so how, how many degrees of freedom are they eh, if you do it by the usual way? How many data points do you need to guess this? So it's out of three so, and degree eight or degree 12, right? Order four, degree 16, I think. Oh, wow. so 17 times yeah. five? 14? Yeah. Is it degree, oh, degree 14. Uh, eight plus one, uh, 14. Yeah, degree 14, not 16. Excuse yeah, me. So, so, we, so it will not be practical to crank out enough terms. Correct. Do, yeah, you know? it would not be practical because the, the number of permutations you have to look at is growing sort of factorially or faster than factorially, actually. So it, it's very difficult to compute enough terms to guess this classically, uh, yeah. because you need sort of degree times order many terms of the sequence at least. So you, you need quite a few terms here to compute this. Now, how do you prove this kind of thing? What do you do? Uh, well, one thing that you don't do is you don't start off by saying, well, take all the permutations and put them into four piles or something like that. You know, th there's not an easy combinatorial proof going on here I exactly. Not one of the traditional ones anyway. Uh, there's no way you're going to get numbers like this out of some very pretty bijection. So almost all of the proofs that Manuel and Christoph were able to find were using some pretty neat computer algebra techniques. Like maybe you can prove that somehow the generating function or some related generating function is the diagonal of a, a rational function or something along those lines uh, using some transfer matrix, metris, uh, transfer matrix methods, some closure properties of holonomic functions, uh, some really heavy-duty computer algebra techniques that uh, Manuel and Christoph are, are very good at. So none of these proofs are, you know, one paragraph kind of things. They're very complicated computer algebra things, which explains why no one has noticed these, let alone proved them, until Manuel and Christoph found them. Okay, so uh, they found about 20 interesting examples. They were able to prove, I think, eight of the examples that they found, uh, the recurrences exactly. They were able to prove that another handful of the recurrences existed and that the sequences were definite, but they couldn't prove the exact recurrence that they found. Uh, and what that left was a couple different open conjectures, I think five or six open conjectures that they had, where they say, we're pretty sure that this sequence satisfies this recurrence, but we just don't know how to prove it yet. Uh, the open conjectures concern a couple different things. A few of them are similar to these permutations. Uh, you know, counting permutations with some restriction. One of them is enumerating graphs with certain restrictions. Uh, there is at least one about certain kinds of permanence. Uh, and then there are two or three of them that are what I would call weird matrix things, where you have some class of matrices that satisfy some strange rules, and you want to count how many of them do that. And those weird matrix things are what I want to talk about today. So I heard that Manuel had some weird matrices that he wanted to count. So I hopped on a plane and I flew to Austria to meet with him. And uh, we worked on trying to count these weird matrix things. So uh, what are they? What are the weird matrix things? 
Uh, back in 2014, uh, Ron Hardin submitted a, a family of sequences, really a family of tables to the OAIS, uh, which are one of the examples is right here. I'll talk about the first example and then we'll get to the later examples later on. <clears throat> so uh, what we wanna do is we wanna count a number of N by K matrices that obey the following rules. Okay, the first rule, is the top left entry has to be zero. Easy enough to check. The next rule is that from any point of the matrix, every king step that you make to the right, down, or southeast has to increase the value that you were standing at by zero or one. And by king step, I mean you move one to the right, one down, or one down and to the right. That has to make things go up by zero or one. Uh, the next rule, is that every value must be one with uh, within one of its king distance from the top left corner. And by king distance, I mean, what's the fewest number of steps that the chess piece king would have to take to get to the, that entry of the matrix. So every value must be within one of that number. And then finally, the bottom right entry has to actually use that bound. The bottom right entry has to equal its king distance minus one from the top left corner. So these are the four rules. And now what this table is, is H1 of NK is the number of the N by K matrices that obey these rules. Okay, this is a little more natural than the first sequence that we talked about way at the beginning, but it's still a little complicated. So let's see an example uh, of what's going on here. Here is a six by five matrix that satisfies all of those rules. Let's go through one at a time and check them. The first rule, Top left corner has to be zero. That's satisfied. Check. Uh, the last rule about the bottom right corner, if you look at this bottom right corner, it said you had to be one less than its king distance. So if you imagine a king in the top left corner, the fastest way to get to the bottom is to walk diagonally. So it would take one step, two steps, three steps, four steps, and then the fifth step. So the king distance from the top left corner is five, which means that we have to put a four here in the bottom right corner. So we, the, the top left and the bottom right, okay, for you, top left, bottom right, everything's good. Now, uh, the rule about taking steps right down, diagonally down, uh, here's one way to verify this. If I'm standing at the zero and I move down into the right, so diagonally, southeast, I went from zero to one. That's okay. I went up by one. The rule says I'm allowed to do that. If I take a step to the right, to the two, I went up by one. That's good. If I take a step down, I went up by zero. I stayed the same. That's okay. If I take another step down and to the right, I went up by one. That's okay. And then if I take another step down and to the right, I went up by one. That's fine. And then when I go down again, I'm still the same at four. So at every step that I took there, I went up by zero or one. And if you go back along the path, you can also check that each of them are within one of their king distance. So zero has king distance zero. That one has distance one. That two has distance two. This two also has distance two, and you can go through and, and verify all of them. And then the question is, how many are there total in a, a six by five? That's what H1 counts. Okay, so uh, when Hardin submitted this, he had a couple of conjectures because it's not that hard to crank out uh, terms of the sequence, at, at least for this special case, uh, where it doesn't get too big too fast. So you don't have to enumerate that many matrices. So the first thing that he conjectured is that the diagonal, the n by n case, the square case, has a simple evaluation, essentially a, a power of four, you know, plus a constant, but a power of four. And he also conjectured that the columns of the table were linear polynomials in n, as long as you were far enough down. As long as n is sufficiently large, then it's a linear polynomial. Uh, in fact, by the way, it doesn't take much thought to realize that this sequence is is symmetric. So if it's a polynomial in the columns, it's also a polynomial in the rows. Uh, if the columns are a polynomial in N, the rows are a polynomial in K. So uh, basically the point is that on the diagonal, you're exponential and then the columns behave kind of polynomial-like. So the, one of the first things that Manuel and I were able to prove is that in fact, this is correct. Uh, it is this exponential term on the diagonal, but we are even able to give an evaluation for essentially, uh, any n by k matrix. So how many of them are there n by k, not just n by n? And it's a pretty simple formula. It doesn't look that much more complicated than the diagonal, but I do think that how simple it is, is a little bit misleading. 
Uh, I do not have some quick snappy proof of this fact. Most of the things that we did to prove this are in a similar vein to the kind of proof that I mentioned for the first example sequence, which is where we're going to pull out some kind of fancy computer algebra techniques or some, some big sledgehammers. In particular, you don't have a combinatorial proof yet. I do actually have a combinatorial proof of this, but ah. you know, the combinatorial proof is not exactly a one paragraph proof. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, this is the only of the sequences that we have anything combinatorial to say, though. Everything else is more complicated. So this count something natural, then you find a bijection to your matrices? Yes, yes, it does count something kind of natural. In fact, if you go back, one suggestion is this path that I drew. There's some kind of bijection between these matrices and paths. Not hmm. this path, but there's something going on there. And yeah. that's, that's one way. Okay, but that was something that we found sort of after the fact, and it didn't really help us in the general case. So uh, how do you prove this? How did we prove this? What was the approach that we thought was most fruitful? So I just want to talk about the diagonal case for now, because the off-diagonal case turns out to be a little weird and, and different. So let's just think about the diagonal case. So to start off by proving something for the diagonal case, what you want to do is you want to just stare at some of the matrices for a while and try and get a sense for what they look like. So here's a seven by seven array. This is a, a one that satisfies all the rules. You want to just look at these and try and find some patterns. One pattern, for example, is the last row and the last column are all fives. That turns out to always be true. That's one of those one of these weird quirks of the rules that in an n by n matrix, the last column and the last row will always be full of n minus twos. So seven by seven turns out to be all fives. But the more interesting thing here is that if you look at this, you realize you can divide this matrix into contiguous partitions or contiguous regions, is what I want to say. There's a region of zeros. There's a region of ones. There's a region of twos, threes, fours, and, and fives, and so on. And also, if you think about it a little bit, once you've done this division, if you kind of work in the other way, for every matrix, you can do this division. But then in the other way, the division actually uniquely defines one of these matrices. Because once you have the regions put down, they kind of have to be labeled in order. The smallest region, the one closest to the top left, has to be 0. The next one has to be 1. If you move out along the layers, the next one has to be 2. The next one has to be 3. So however you drew the regions, as long as you, you've drawn them uh, suitably, the, the labels are fixed then. You know what the values of the matrix will be. Uh, and they kind of all get drawn the same way. The regions always start on the left in the first column, and they always end on the top in the first row. You'll start between two entries in the first column and end between two entries in the first row. So in fact, if you want to enumerate these matrices, what you need to do is find the number of ways to draw these regions, which is really the number of ways to draw the boundaries of the regions. Another way to phrase this is you want to count the sets of non-intersecting lattice paths from the first column up to the first row. So how many ways can you make these different walks from one side to the top that don't ever intersect each other? This is the number of ways to get these you know, sort of non-empty contiguous regions. So this is a reduction. We, we started off with these funny rules, and then you can reduce it down to counting non-intersecting lattice paths, which is a lot more familiar than trying to think about king moves and things along that line. OK, now, it is great that we want to talk about counting non-intersecting lattice paths, because there is a pretty well-known theorem that can turn non-intersecting lattice path questions into questions about determinants. So I think it's hard to count non-intersecting lattice paths, but it's very easy to compute determinants. And there's a theorem that lets you translate from one to the other pretty straightforwardly. This is the theorem of Gessel and Villeneuve. And it runs like this. You take any uh, set of distinct start points, uh, so n distinct start points. In our case, this will be positions in the first column. And then you take any uh, n distinct end points, which for us will be positions in the first row. And what the setup is, is that we want to count the number of non-intersecting lattice paths that go from x1 to y1, from the first start point to the first end point, from the second start point to the second end point. And here's how Gessel v. Anu tells you you can do this. You write down a matrix. It's an n by n matrix where the ijth entry is the number of 
unrestricted lattice paths from the ith start point to the jth endpoint. So you don't have to worry about them not being intersecting. You just think about each of the points, each of the pairs of points independently, and you count the number of lattice paths to get from one to the other. And then Gessel Vianu tells you the determinant of this matrix tells you the number of sets of non-intersecting lattice paths where the first start point goes to the first endpoint, second start point goes to the second endpoint, and so on. So what the plan of attack here is to write down this matrix. Write down the matrix, compute the determinant, you get the number of non-intersecting paths, and you're done. So this reduces us from the weird, complicated rules that Hardin came up with down to non-intersecting lattice paths, and then through Gessel via Nu down to just computing determinants, which is now much more mechanical than where we started trying to prove things about these rules. Now, there is a small technical problem. The, the plan of attack is pretty straightforward. Find the matrix and compute its determinant. But in fact, if you go back and think about the picture, there is not just one matrix to find. There are many different matrices to find. So th these regions, each time you draw them, they determine what the array has to look like. But the start and end points of the regions are not fixed. So in this particular array, the zero region started as soon as it could and then ended as soon as it could. There's only one zero. But there could have been a second zero in the first column, which would have pushed the boundary of the zero region down further. Or there could have been a second zero in the first row, which would have pushed the, the boundary out a little bit. So actually, what you need to consider is all the different places that the paths could start and the paths could end. And for every possible combination of those choices, you will have a different matrix that counts the number of ways to draw the paths with those start points and those endpoints. And what you now need to do is take the determinant of all of those matrices and then add them together. And that's that's the actual application of Gessel via new here. And now a quick word about how many matrices there are. Uh, if you look at this picture long enough and think through the rules for a little bit, you'll find out that there is exactly one position in the first row and the first column that will not be used, used starts or ends there. So uh, for example, in between any two entries in the first row, Are you talking? Robert, I can't hear you. Ah, how okay. about now? Now I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, let me say that again to make sure we're on the same page. So uh, between any two entries, you'll have this path that cuts them, except for one of them. And on the first row, it's the two ones. On the first column, it's the two twos. Uh, so there will be a matrix for every possible choice of row and column position that you didn't use. All right, so uh, in summary, our application of Gessel via Nu actually looks like this. I have a different matrix for every possible choice of row position and column position to ignore, to not use as a starter endpoint. I need to take the determinant of that matrix and then add up all the, term the determinants over all possible choices of row and column. And that's how we get the, the in diagonal entry. Okay, now we actually need to figure out what these matrices are, these weird AIJs. Unsurprisingly, they turn out to be related to the binomial matrix. Because if you think about our lattice paths, all they're doing is moving to the right and up. It's pretty standard to count the number of paths from one point to another point. If all you can do is move to the right and up, it's a binomial coefficient. I plus J, choose I, something like that. So uh, you take this matrix, the standard binomial coefficient matrix, and if you sit down and you look at the rules and what it means to skip a position in a row or a column, it turns out that the AIJ matrix is this standard binomial matrix where you delete the ith row and the jth column. So what that means is that the nth diagonal term is the sum of the determinant of this binomial matrix with the i ith row and jth column deleted when there you sum over all i and j, which is a bit like Laplace expansion, except not exactly. 
because Laplace expansion would require that there's some coefficients on the determinants. It would require there's a sign for the way that you're choosing them. Uh, we don't have any of that here. It's just the sum of these um, minors, of, of these determinants of the minors. Uh, but that's the application of gessel vianu That's where we get down to, we have to now find a way to evaluate this sum of determinants. All right, now there are a couple different ways to do this. We we came up with three reasonable approaches for evaluating this sum of determinants. And I don't want to get into the technical details about them because they take up pages in our paper, let alone the number of slides they would take up. But the three ways that we had is we actually did find one pretty neat way to evaluate this using Laplace expansion. Uh, you take the binomial matrix, you augment it in some clever way, and it turns out the determinant of that thing turns out to be the sum. And that's uh, there's a neat proof of that. Uh, the second one is through this. You have a single matrix, and then you can express this sum of determinant a determinant of a one matrix? Yes, that is correct. Very nice. Uh, however, it really only works for this case. It doesn't really work the same way for any other case. So it, it's a very neat trick. It, I, I like it a lot, but it doesn't generalize particularly well, I would say. Uh, the other idea is Dodgson's condensation identity, which is this famous identity. We can't hear you again. Which oftentimes, ah, how about now? You now I can hear you, but hopefully it won't happen again. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Well, if you can't hear me, there's there's not too much longer. You won't have to, you won't be able to hear me for so okay. <laughs> as we near the end of the talk. Okay. Okay. So there's the standard identity uh, called Dodgson's condensation identity, um, which tells you how to relate determinants of matrices where you delete rows and columns with determinants of other matrices where you delete different rows and different columns. And this oftentimes makes up the backbone for some kind of induction proof where I say, okay, I delete this row and this column, and that's like working with the smaller matrix and deleting different rows and different columns. Uh, and if you apply this carefully and then you write down some summations, you get certain recurrences. And those recurrences are the ones that we were looking for. Uh, the other way that we did this is using some pretty heavy-duty computer algebra where you can kind of go and do some sophisticated guess and check procedures that turn out to be completely rigorous using some properties of uh, holonomic functions and the closure properties there. So there are a lot of uh, really nice Mathematica implementations that Manuel and Christoph have that let you rigorously evaluate these kinds of determinants and then rigorously evaluate these sums in the sense of finding recurrences that everything satisfies. So there are these effective techniques that can give you recurrences of these kinds of sums. And as long as the determinants and the sums are not too big and too unwieldy, then you can actually uh, compute these recurrences explicitly. Um, now, I will say that each of these have different drawbacks to them. They have pros and cons. Uh, the pro of the Laplace expansion argument is that it's really slick and uh, fun to write down. The con is that it doesn't really generalize to anything except this first case. Uh, Dodgson is nice in that it's sort of well-known and classical. It's been around for quite some time, and people use it all over the place. But it is a little cumbersome to write down. Like, the equation itself is kind of gross to look at. Uh, the computer algebra approach is great because it's effective, but the downside is that you need everything to be small enough to actually be computable. And at a certain point, when we start to talk about generalizations of these sequences, it gets a little unwieldy. Uh, so this is essentially the end of the story for this sequence, but Hardin actually submitted a family of sequences. And the family of sequences is actually more amenable to the condensation identity. So that was what we ended up using to prove more things about the family of sequences. OK, so what was the actual generalization of hardened sequences? What was he talking about um, in, in the general case? <clears throat> so I've been calling this initial sequence h sub 1, and the generalization is h sub r. And it counts almost exactly the same thing, the number of n by k matrices that satisfy the following rules. The first rule is the same. The top left entry needs to be 0. 
The next rule is the same. Every step to the right, down, or southeast has to increase the value by zero or one. The next rule is slightly different, where every value needs to be within <clears throat> not one, but within r of its king distance from the top left corner. So you're allowed a little bit more flexibility than you were in the past. And then correspondingly, the final rule takes advantage of this flexibility, and it says that the bottom right entry has to actually equal its king distance minus r. So you get some lower bound, and the bottom right entry uses that lower bound. So as, as you would expect, uh, these sequences get to be bigger and bigger and bigger because you're allowing more and more flexibility. Uh, there are more of them, which means that they get harder and harder to enumerate, which means that there is less and less data in the OEIS. Uh, and actually, how Manuel and Christoph first found the sequence was looking at the R equals 2 case, where there was not that much data, but it, it was there. Uh, and Manuel and Christoph were able to conjecture a recurrence. And then Manuel and I went back and proved it later on. Uh, in fact, we proved a little bit more general theorem. Uh, we proved that the diagonal of all of these sequences is definite. So you pick any R that you want, any positive integer, and it turns out the diagonal is D finite. So they all satisfy some recurrence. Uh, for R equals 1, the recurrence is simple enough that you can compute this closed form that I mentioned uh, hard and conjectured in the beginning. For R equals 2, the recurrence is simple enough that you can compute it using computer algebra, but it's one of these recurrences that takes almost half a page written out in tech, just in our paper, so I won't write it down here. Uh, for R equals three and above, the recurrences get to be too big for us to actually compute them using effective methods. So tracing through some arguments in the Dodgson's condensation identity, we can prove that these things are definite, but we don't actually know what the recurrences involved are. We just know that they're there, but we don't actually know how to write them down just yet. So uh, I guess, in theory, there are some more conjectures to be found there. What are those recurrences? That... I already forgot to mention that the Cowens and Kushner have a beautiful implementation, but it's all based on the so-called wealth Zabagal algorithmic proof theory. Yes, of course. This is what a lot of their stuff is based on. A lot of their efficient Mathematica impl uh, implementations are spin-offs of the, the, the wolf Zalberger approach. Yeah. So there's still a lot of conjectures to be found here uh, in these diagonal cases. Like, what are those recurrences? Uh, we could imagine maybe finding even better guessing procedures that could guess them. Uh, but for now, at least we know that the diagonals are all definite. Uh, but there are some other uh, sort of explicit conjectures that we can make. So Hardin made these conjectures that the columns of the first table, uh, the H1, that they were linear polynomials. And we were able to prove that. Uh, however, I've only been talking about the diagonal case, and that's because other than r equals 1, we don't know how to do the columns for r equals 2 or r equals 3 or 4 or anything. But we have enough data to make conjectures. Uh, so I think even Hardin had made these conjectures before us, uh, that for r equals 2, the columns seem to be quadratic polynomials. And for r equals 3, the columns seem to be cubic polynomials. And for 4, they seem to be quadratic, and, and so on uh, in general. For HR, the columns seem to be polynomials of degree R. We have lots of other conjectures, like, for example, maybe the coefficients here themselves are definite. Maybe they satisfy some recurrences. We really don't know. We don't know how to prove that these are the right polynomials. We don't know how to prove that they need to be polynomials. Uh, we definitely don't know how to come up with recurrences that the coefficients might satisfy. So there are still a lot of open conjectures kind of lurking around these tables, uh, the columns, the rows, even on the diagonals, trying to find the explicit recurrences. Is two of n one is officially open? Uh, oh, I think okay. H two of n one, I think, is easy enough that you can do it in like five minutes. Yeah, but H two of n two, when you have an n by two matrix, it gets to be difficult. Yeah, okay, n by one is, is trivial. That's, okay, theorem, first one. But uh, beyond that, it's more complicated. But some of them are open? I think all of them, except the first two at best, are open. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I believe the UAS still says that there are conjectures, but they are listed in the OAS. Is there the very, for sure, only the H2N1 uh, has fractions as coefficients, the others are integers. This is actually a binomial coefficient, though. I think it's oh. like n minus one choose two. 
So an accident that it happens to be a fraction. Yes. Okay, so just to wrap up uh, quickly, so we can all go to dinner. Uh, there are a lot of conjectures in the OAS, uh, both here in this project about these Hardinian arrays, but also uh, more generally, just in the data that's already there. There's a lot of things that could be mined there. And I think that Manuel and Christoph had a, a really great project. And I think that we should try and build on this and maybe automate some kind of OEIS scanning procedure to try and pick up when new conjectures could be found. That would be a really neat project, I think. Um, especially using some of the fancy computer algebra. As the years go by, we keep getting better and better algorithms, better and better implementations. Someone should really be systematically going back and checking all the things that we had before uh, to see if there's anything new that could happen. Uh, and then finally, with my visit uh, to Manuel in Linz, I learned that Linz has really great public transit. So if you ever find yourself in Austria, I highly recommend getting on a train, going to Linz, uh, buying a ticket so you can take the tram up from the university down to the city center and just sitting back and thinking about determinants for a while. It's a, it's a really pleasant experience. But uh, that's all I have to say today. So that was in, in August and because we don't have air conditioning. Maybe not when there's, maybe not in the summer, maybe in winter it'd be better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for a great talk. We have time for some questions to Robert. Any questions to Robert? Yeah, I have a question. I, am I on? Yes. Uh, I, I just want to say that Ron Harden and I have collaborated for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years. And he was one of the great programmers at Bell Labs. And even in the Unix room, where the people worked who developed Unix and many other things, he was a legend. He was one of the great programmers of all time. And I remember there was a time when he bought... This was a very long time ago. He bought a hundred PCs and he connected them all together and he would run jobs like enumerating things that you've been talking about, enumerating matrices or things with various um, matrices with various properties and other kinds of, of functions. And uh, he would program on these hundred PCs and they would run in parallel he was the great master of parallel processing. And um, when the job, and he, he didn't need to heat his house because the heat from all <laughs> of these PCs heated the house. And when one particular job finished, he could tell because the, the furnace would turn on. <laughs> we, we have a number of joint papers. If you look at my publication list, we, we did many wonderful things. He, yeah. he, I haven't seen him for a very long time. And I wish I had. But he's an right? old friend. He's an old friend and a wonderful programmer. So, Robert, well, you have to contact him. He's still alive, Neil, right? Absolutely. Hey, yeah, he would really like his talk. You should have asked him. Yeah, wonderful programmer and a, a wonderful uh, creator of conjectures. Yeah, he's really neat. It's a good story. Yeah, yeah, lots of. Yeah. Other questions to Robert? Uh, so I make a comment. So I think when you have n copies, so did you also do when the simpler case, we have n copies of one, n copies of two, and then probably trivial, avoiding mm -hmm. one point to one. But did you do it for an arbitrary? Uh, did you go on? It's well, a... so this was just an example that Manuel and Christoph did. So it would be worth asking them. Uh, I would suspect that they did not look very closely at all possible generalizations of the things that they found. There, uh -huh. were, there were too many of them. Uh -huh. um, but I think it, it's worth looking at. I'm sure that if, you know, why would the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 be special, right? Of course, there must be something true for 1, 2, 3, up to n. For yeah, it's always a rational function. So diagonal is always uh, definite. Right. But it would be interesting to see maybe the commentator proofs of the recurrences. Or yeah, I agree. For that one, there must be something, but it, it seems like it would be hard to come up with by accident. You'd have to look at it intently for a while. Anyway, it's really a nice project. Well, are there more questions for Robert? Okay, thank you so much for coming. The next talk is in two weeks by Mani Mishnah. Uh, and thanks so much. And Robert, please end this seminar. Thank you very much, Kato. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.